thanks for the intro. Good morning. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, I'm in the wrong time zone, actually. I, uh, I, was, just, I was just pointing out that uh, this is the first day I live here in Montreal. This is the first day that I've set foot on Canadian soil in 2015. I just flew in last night. Um, so it's a pleasure being here. And they, um, the organizers reached out to me and asked me to talk a bit about uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, now, for me, that means a very peculiar type of entrepreneurship that's probably fairly applicable to you. Because I, um, so just like you, uh, for obvious reasons, I was an undergrad student at some point, and I was a graduate student, and you know, and so forth. And, but the vast majority of my entrepreneurial career actually happens in parallel to my education. So, you know, my, my bio and pictures looks a bit like this. I, uh, uh, early during undergrad, right at the end of first year, started a company called Sunnybrook. Uh, that one went well, then started a company called Brightside. Uh, sold that one to Dolby Labs, uh, built Dolby's video business unit while being a uh, master's student, um, and eventually sort of wiggled my way into a PhD. Uh, and now at Tandem Launch, we build lots of companies. Uh, so I've basically, for I started at the age of 19, so for my whole adult life, I have done one thing and one thing only. I suck at everything else. Uh, but the one thing I, I know how to do is to build companies, and particularly I know how to build uh, deep technology companies. Lots more logos here. Um, and I built them essentially in a very straightforward pattern. Identify really profound, interesting technology at universities generally. These are all universities we've uh, done, built companies with. Uh, find those awesome technologies. Then find awesome people that float around in those laboratories and those you know, engineering schools attached to those things and uh, either work with them directly in my early years. I, I ran these companies these days. I helped them uh, form high growth, high value companies uh, around those technologies and then build them. Um, now, there's lots of accelerators out there. Uh, there's lots of people that do this. There's a lot of people that do this sort of stuff in the web space where the dynamics are a little bit different. Uh, we'll, we'll come a little bit more about this, but the one distinction we have, we're certainly not the smartest people. We're certainly not, well, I hope we're not the hardest working because that would sort of suck. Um, but we, we hold the distinction that in 15 years of doing this, I've never lost a company. So we've built companies that consistently over 15 years have uh, been economically successful. Obviously, some of them are still alive, so they're still undecided. Uh, but nothing has ever folded. All, everything has always raised financing. Um, and so, you know, after doing this for a decade and a half and, and seeing that it sort of can consistently work, uh, a few people asked me uh, why, right? If, you know, if the averages in most startups are nine or 10 croak in the first year, then you know, 15 years of, of doing this and, and not having a single one fail means that either we're insanely lucky and it should get into gambling or there's actually a recipe to it. And it's the recipe that I want to talk a little bit about because the recipe is something that I would like you to leave uh, when you leave here tomorrow uh, with a bit of a sense that you could be part of that recipe at Tandem Launch or really anywhere else. Uh, the recipe is not, we, we just execute it. We just, uh, you know, the recipe is in your head, not in any kind of organization, though you're most welcome to show up with us as well. Um, and to do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the why, the when, and the how of entrepreneurship. Um, the, the why is the easy part, well, it's, it's, I think, very hard conceptually, but it's the easy part. I, I nevertheless wanted to talk a little bit about it because it maybe provides a bit of insight about how I think about entrepreneurship and how I therefore think about success in the context. So. It all starts with Marx. So, you know, 200 years ago or so, we created, or we, you know, our forefathers created this really simple economic equation that pretty much everybody who thinks about the economy still kind of sort of thinks about, right? So you, you take manual labor and you apply it to some raw materials, and if you want to be fancy, you call those things, you know, you add means of production. Uh, and basically some product comes out of it, and then you sell that product, and that's how you build value, and that's how you build a company. And everything from our economic policy to policies to, uh, you know, educational policy to the government to all this stuff is sort of underlying, underlying has this, uh, this theory. And I think this theory is bullshit. I think this theory, uh, yeah, you, can think, you can see that I'm a popular guy at universities. Um, the, you know, I, I, I get invited a lot to economics departments. I only get invited once, though. So I've never been invited twice. Um, the, and the reason why I think it's bullshit is not that it was a bad theory. It's just that it's the theory of the 19th century. And there's two things that have changed in the 21st century. And those are becoming really important for entrepreneurship. And the people that don't get those two things um, will fail. The first thing has changed is that the value 
of labor uh, is basically declining to the point of uselessness. Um, now, this is going to be very hard to absorb for society. Uh, people hate that. You know, politicians hate that. They go around and say, you know, oh, we need to have 6% unemployment or 2% or whatever, some small number. It's like, well, that's over. Because if you look at the blue graph, the blue graph is um, the work hours per week. And you see that they have been falling quite steadily. Um, and then there's something we did wrong after World War II. Like somehow they flatten out. They shouldn't because productivity, which is the red one, has been increasing astronomically. And obviously GDP hasn't, you know, GDP should theoretically just be the product of those two. If you, if you work at this efficiency, you're all engineers. So if you work at a certain efficiency multiplied by a certain input, you know, number of hours at a certain efficiency, which is productivity, that should give you GDP in broad strokes. Uh, and, and the equation doesn't solve. If you want to solve the equations, it actually needs to be like the, um, the dotted line that I drew there. So we should be working 20 hour weeks. Uh, the only reason why we don't work 20 hour weeks and instead of work 40 hour weeks is because we created a whole bunch of bullshit jobs. Um, consultants, accountants, lawyers. Uh, no, you, you, I don't get invited to those schools very often either. Um, <laughs> but you, you, you know, we've created a whole bunch of jobs that have really no particular net productivity, but they move stuff from A to B and, and you know, they're not in the business of value equation, they're in the business of value distribution or redistribution. Um, uh, you know, decent coding of those jobs isn't, isn't bad, but you know, we, we are living in economies now where 60 to 80% of those jobs are in that category in Canada, for example, which is obviously a disaster. Um, so step one, labor itself doesn't really matter anymore. It, it used to be, you know, you would go to a social club and you would drink your beer or not beer, your wine, and you would go, you know, I'm the owner of a company with 600 employees. We would go, oh, wow, wow, well, I'm the owner of a company with 1,000 employees. Oh, wow, even bigger, right? And these days, if you can build Instagram with 12 guys, build it with 12 guys. Don't hire 120. You would be stupid to hire 120. So the, the marginal utility of, of labor is basically approaching zero. And this will get worse. As the 21st century progresses, working hard is useless. Get that in your head. Working hard is useless. Working smart is important. The second thing is these vaunted means of production that you used to need. You, need to need. you needed capital, you needed factory space, all that stuff in the 18th century, 19th century, they needed to build stuff. That's kind of going the way of the dodo too, right? So the, the, um, what you have there is the, the red graph or the red bars are the increase in dollar volume in additive manufacturing. Some people know that as 3D printing. So that's basically factoryless, factory less uh, manufacturing. That's rising like crazy. Um, even more so, you have crowdfunding and other financing mechanisms that are spiking up. So this, this notion where you need to be sort of this gray-haired guy who has a big factory and has to go to another gray-haired guy who writes a giant check to float your operating capital, that's going away. Th that will stay in certain industry like you know, mining or something, but in a lot of industry, that's just going away. And this, again, will simply change the landscape. So the, the economic equation that I think of for the 21st century goes something like that. You need to have uh, really smart entrepreneurial people who can rally, uh, um, you know, rally people around a mission, basically, who can make stuff happen, who can launch activities, then you need innovation that these guys can latch onto and drive forward. And if you get that, wonderful things happen. You think about it, these guys, SpaceX in this case, they sent stuff into orbit. It took a United States, you know, national mission to do this the first time. And now it's a private company that comes out of nowhere, right? SpaceX or you know, Tesla or whatever. The guy had time to build two companies, three companies at the same time, right? So one guy can start three companies that accomplish stuff that a mere 30, 40 years ago required a national effort, you know, political structure, can be done by one guy. This really hasn't happened in human history before. Like the, the great works of man, economically, socially, structurally, were based on this huge government initiative that took decades to get into fruition. Individual people can move the needle to this point today. And that will only get, well, worse if you're a lawyer, better if you're an entrepreneur. So this is really important because what that means is the why about entrepreneurship isn't just about it's fun and you learn a lot and the usual stuff you will hear, and I'm sure you've heard over the, whole, over the whole few days of this conference already. I believe in those things too. It's the, you know, the best thing I've ever done in my life. It's super fun, it's exciting. But it's fundamentally about betterment of society. At a very deep level, if Canada wants to stay a wealthy country, the way to be wealthy isn't anymore to have a well-educated middle class and to have a lot of resources. That's the old equation, right? 
It's about having an unfair share of the world's visionaries, an unfair share of the world's inventors, and an unfair share of the world's entrepreneurs. And if we do not have that, our standard of living will decline to the average level of society. I ran some math a few years ago. The average undergrad educated engineer in the world makes six and a half thousand dollars per year, not per month, right? Because that's, it's us and then it's India and China and, and you know, Africa and whatever. The average across the population of engineering degree people is eight and a half, uh, six and a half thousand dollars. Unless you want to live on six and a half K a year, you better encourage yourself, your government, your university to do this stuff, because if not, start, you know, start stocking up on ramen or something. All right, that brings us to the, to the when. Um, the when, I have some good news. I already can tell you, and the how, I have some really shitty news for you. But the, the when, I've got to you know, keep up the enthusiasm so you all, all don't leave. Um, the when, the good news is, more than ever, innovation, which hopefully is the stuff you're doing. You guys are all undergrad students in engineering, I hope, um, unless some have smuggled in here. Uh, if there's lawyers here, this only gets worse in this talk, you know, just <laughs> hide quickly. Um, the, um, you all hopefully work somewhere in the world of innovation. And the nice thing is for you that innovation has become the single most critical factor in all layers of the economy. The, the graph down there, uh, I, I come out of the consumer electronics industry, which is a you know, trillion dollar industry. It's you know, Apple, Sony, Samsung, all these big companies are in there. This is the uh, share price behavior of the top 10 by revenue, top 10 consumer electronics companies in the last five years. In other words, there are a bunch of companies that have been successful, well, two really, massively so, uh, and in fact, there would only be one if Apple weren't a closed ecosystem, but Apple were competing on an open market, there would only be one, I can almost guarantee you this. Everybody else is a loser. In fact, the only two companies that are stable are Google and Microsoft. They're basically monopoly companies, so they don't really you know, experience market fluctuations. I mean, they're basically a search engine and an operating system monopoly company. When you look at the same share prices of the same companies five years before, it looks totally different. For the last 50 years, since most of these companies have come into existence, the share price of the consumer electronic industry has largely tracked on a common baseline. So when you know, times were good, all the manufacturers moved up. When times were bad, they all moved down. Why is it that in the last five years, they have split so sharply into winners and losers and continue to split in this aggressive, disruptive pattern where some win and most of them lose? It is because we have made this transition from a you know, resource and labor-based economy to one that is entirely based on innovation and entrepreneurship. If you are innovative as a company, you win. If you are not, then in three years, you go from being a rich, big company to basically being a territory where your CEO writes suicide notes. That's what, you know, if you lose 94% of your share price, that's what happens. You're looking for the window to jump out of. Take your lawyer with you. <laughs> the, um, so the good news is you guys are the supposed innovators, right? So the first message here is not when in terms of you know, how old you are, what time and time. It's the moment you come close to innovation, latch onto it and don't let go. If your advisor tells you, you should be taking this course and not work in this lab, slap him. You want to work where innovation happens. Innovation doesn't happen in classes, innovation doesn't happen in social clubs, innovation doesn't happen anywhere on campus except in the labs. Stick to the labs and stick to the labs that actually innovate and don't just do useless work. But most of them actually do have to innovate, otherwise they don't get money. The second good news for you is that we live in an absolute surge of investment into innovation. Uh, this is, again, my industry, consumer electronics. This is the amount of venture capital that has gone into this industry. Uh, and you can see it like totally skyrocketing in 2012, 2013 into unheard territory. The, uh, when I started setting up Tandem Launch five years ago as a consumer electronics uh, accelerator, first of all, nobody knew what an accelerator was because Y Combinator was just gearing up and it was also a bit shaky. Um, we didn't call ourselves an accelerator either at that time. Uh, but I went around here in Montreal, I, I moved here from Silicon Valley, and I said, well, I want to do this in consumer electronics. And they're going, what? You know, that you can't do that. It's small, it's hardware, it's technology. You know, people want to do websites. And I'd just like to point out, in 2013, uh, for the first time, Venture capital investment in hardware was more than venture capital investment in the sum total of e-commerce and web. Sorry, web, web, mobile, you know, all the whole category. So 
there's a unique opportunity because not only are you guys closest to the source of innovation, for the first time in, in history, really, there's now capital, which is what you probably need, coming towards this stuff. Rather than spending capital on vapid stuff, people are actually willing to invest and take risk on deep technology, whether it's in the consumer electronics space, whether it's in uh, industrial application, whether it's in you know, biomedical application. For the first time, engineers will actually at a high rate get funded for what they did and invented in school as opposed to you do some really cool biomedical engineering stuff and then you get funded for building a picture app. You have a chance that I didn't have. 15 years ago, you had to do bullshit. I, you know, I had to shoestring my first two companies. There's actually people that want to give you money to do the stuff that you've been trained to do. That's got to be good. And your opportunity is huge. Your opportunity is huge because universities, the places where you study, spend more money on innovation, on creating ideas, than anything else on the planet. In the US, the entire US economy is essentially based around the $16 billion of research, industrial research, because the conversion rate of university stuff into industrial application is near zero. So that 16 billion of industrial research drives the US economy. Untouched to it is three to four times more money in university that doesn't go out. The principal reason why it doesn't go out is because there's no way to take it out. And that's where the opportunity comes in for people like you. The opportunity is that once you have your nose in the lab, you can find stuff that is really cool, and you can take it out in the world, and not only can you have a shit, you know, make a lot of money and, and have a lot of fun, you can actually move the needle in a field that you aspire to hopefully move the needle in. So do it now. That's the short answer to when. You have this opportunity to innovate, you have the opportunity to, at the university, you have access to technology that you generally can't find in the, in the wild. Use this opportunity today. I see a lot of undergrads that come to me in their, you know, in their fourth year, months before graduation. They go, Helge, I want to be an entrepreneur. You know, I need an idea. And I'm like, dude, you just spent four years in a place where ideas are shoveled around like they're free candy. And you're coming to me now and you're going to some you know, local social club or some local bar or something to figure out an idea. Good luck. There's people paid. There's about a thousand researchers at McGill that are paid to find up good ideas. And you walk away from those guys and you can instead go try and find it on TechCrunch. Not going to happen, at least not the good stuff. So do it now. The how is when I come to some of the bad news for you guys. The bad news is that while there's been a huge surge in sort of entrepreneurial interest, the actual rate of successful business creation has gone in the toilet. So the, uh, the graphs there, the, the red graph shows the number of actually active entrepreneurs per capita uh, in, in Canada in this case. US numbers are no better. Uh, this is a bit surprising, right? So, so we had more active entrepreneurs in the 80s than we have today, despite the fact that we have TechCrunch and that we have venture capital and we have all these glorious things that should be doing this and everybody's excited about it. We actually have fewer active entrepreneurs than before. And moreover, the blue line on the other side shows the percentage of those active entrepreneurs that are, that are young, where young is generally defined as below 45. So it's a very broad definition of young. Um, and that's falling like a rock too. So, so what gives, right? How do we have all this enthusiasm for entrepreneurship and actually the rate of young entrepreneurs is, is you know, at an exponential rate falling in the toilet? Uh, because if you compound these two numbers, you know, if, you, if you bake out the number of young entrepreneurs, it's actually falling at twice that rate and very steeply. The reason for this is that while there's a lot of enthusiastic you know, entrepreneurs in the early years, uh, the vast majority of them go nowhere. The vast majority of successful companies, despite the myth of the sole undergrad dropout who you know, builds a giant company, crash and burn if they're not founded by people who know what they're doing. Generally speaking, young people don't know what they're doing. In fact, uh, and this is compounded by the fact that not only do we create this deceptive culture of like the dropout is the most successful one, uh, we also have some barriers around uh, universities not being very good with getting technology sent off to undergrads. They usually you know, sort of think about it's the professor that should commercialize the invention. And of course, those are the people, generally speaking, least capable of commercializing anything. Otherwise, they wouldn't be professors in the first place. Um, the, uh, not, not maliciously, it's just if, you, if you've chosen a profession that focuses on research, then you've, by definition, not chosen a profession that focuses on commercialization. And so you're probably not the best person to do the commercialization. Um, Whereas undergrads, on the other hand, are the sort of blank sheet where you know, their, their specialization hasn't been written down yet, so they must actually learn commercialization. 
Um, we also have a problem that we have a lot of capital, but very weak capital, especially here in Canada. The vast majority of uh, funding uh, does not come from people who have actually built companies, and if, even if it comes from people who have been involved in building companies, generally speaking, not from technical people. And so the deeper technology you want to build, the harder it becomes to find investors that actually understand what you're doing and are willing to add value and able to add value. Uh, that is changing. Uh, th that's obviously better in, in areas like the Silicon Valley, uh, but here in Canada, it's still definitely a weak spot where the majority of capital we have is managed by either banking people or sort of uh, non-technical uh, folks. All of those uh, contribute uh, to the fact that, as I mentioned, um, while there's a ton of interest in entrepreneurship among young people, their failure rate is horrendously high. This is a, uh, this is a study done by the Kaufman Foundation over 3,000 uh, operational and successful startups showing the age of age and education of the founders uh, at launch time. And you see that the vast majority of founders in the successful companies that actually worked out are you know, in their mid-30s to early 40s. Um, you also see, by the way, to, to dispel the notion of the dropout, that practically none of the successful ones have dropped out, or most of them. In fact, there's the, the red stuff is PhDs. Um, there's vastly more PhDs than there are uh, dropouts. Uh, so if anything, it's cute. So the, the actual average successful entrepreneur out of that data set is 39 years old, has a master's degree, um, in electrical engineering. So if you're on that trajectory, you're good to go. Uh, the, you know, so, but we, we have the, also the study which I found absolutely lovely, the study shows that uh, polite people are massively so more successful than assholes, um, which is, I found incredibly gratifying. As somebody who has made a mission out of having a nice culture in our operation, so we have about 60 people in teams of you know, three to ten building these companies that we help them build, um, and we make it a rule that that you know uh, we need to be nice. And I found it very gratifying that this actually study it shows that that means it makes you successful. But um, the the real key is actually having experience matters. Domain knowledge is relevant. So this is the trick, right? So I've just told you, you know, you should become entrepreneurs because doing so is really valuable both for yourself and for the country. Uh, you should do it now because you have access to universities and you have all these good things that, are, that are, you know, you get going for yourself. Except now I'm telling you, you will fail. That kind of sucks. Um, but you know, it's not my problem. Um, no, but <laughs> so you know, like if I were a politician, I would stop right here. I would just go, yeah, well, we'll they'll find out. Um, but <laughs> but you know, I, I figure I, I conclude my talk with being a little bit helpful on on the end there. Um, so so here's some tips in terms of how you could mitigate that problem. The, the first thing that I would strongly recommend is uh, stop reading TechCrunch. Uh, stop buying into the mythos of how startups are created. I have built a few startups. I've had, I've had you know, articles written about my companies. I've had books written about uh, two of my companies. Um, everybody gets it wrong. Everything, you know, when you're the inside guy, you're reading these stories, it's like, that's not exactly what happened, right? It was like blood, sweat, and tears for X number of years, not an overnight success. It, it never is an overnight success. And similarly, the narrative of like the one young guy who you know builds the company is bullshit. I, I saw the um, the founder of Oculus, you know, the, the the twenty year old kid on the on the cover of Forbes, you know. And you actually go to the and, and, you know the whole Forbes article is about like how this young guy goes off and built this built to a company that gets acquired by Facebook for two billion dollars. And then you uh, you actually just have to go as far as Wikipedia and go. There's actually seven founders. The, the other six who hold all the C-level titles, he doesn't hold any C-level title, who hold the other six C-level titles are uniformly above the age of 45, uniformly have before starting this company been C-level executives of other large corporations. Uh, they just get omitted by the article, literally. Um, so don't buy into the storyline. Optimize for learning early on. You, you don't, if you're smart, and engineers hopefully are, uh, you don't have to go out there and build the first billion dollar company on your first try. Try to figure out how you learn to become that 30 year old, 38 year old, you know, smart domain knowledgeable entrepreneur, except try to find a way to become that guy by the age of 30, not by the age of 38. That's your competitive advantage. If you figure out how to really own a domain, have knowledge in that domain, be able to lead people, be able to evangelize, you will go very, very far. And that, I think, would be the first thing what I would recommend you do. Uh, also, while you're doing this, is keep your lifestyle flexible. Don't, you know, don't buy all this fancy stuff that makes it harder for you to start the next company at the age of you know, 28, 29, because once you've done that, you take yourself out of the race. 
The second thing to do, and I speak from personal experience here, this is little me there at the age of 19. Um, uh, I look surprisingly similar, but smaller. Um, <laughs> the, uh, in, in all dimensions, actually. Uh, the, um, so, you know, I started out and there was little me. And what I did, the first thing I did, which was a godsend for, for basically the entire success I've had in my career, is I found partners. I brought in a very strong board. I brought in a whole bunch of technology advisors. I surrounded myself with fellow executives. There are my six guys, uh, like the Oculus guy. And that group of people, you notice one thing. Everybody has gray hair. Um, everybody is uniformly 20 years older than me. My entire board, executive team, advisors, everybody around me was literally twice my age. And this had a tremendously positive impact on me because it forces you to play the game at a much higher level. It not only is a great opportunity to learn, it also means that your startup is much more likely to be successful, which gives you even more opportunity to learn and also to make money. Um, but it also prevents you from being a Mickey Mouse startup. The, the biggest curse of society, what, for me, which is contributing to this weird ratio where entrepreneurship is super cool, but the rate of actually successful entrepreneurs in the toilet, is that there are too many undergrad students or any kind of people that built these Mickey Mouse startups where they sort of, you know, they have an idea that's kind of not that great. They have a team that's kind of just as weak as them and they, they futz around and they, you know, they, uh, Paul Graham from Micromary calls this playing house. They sort of pretend they're a startup. They do all that. They go through the motions, you know, they, they pitch, they get an accelerator, they raised a few thousand dollars and they get their TechCrunch article, but they don't actually do anything. They don't actually know how to do anything. Um, and then they fold. Uh, that's bad for two reasons. One, it gives everybody else a bad reputation. And two, uh, you're just wasting a lot of cycles of the universe. So at Tandem Launch, we try to do this. This is the proverbial pitch for what we do. My, my marketing people won't let me go if I don't do this. Um, what we do is we try to help people build those kind of companies. So and we do so iteratively. We start with industry problems. We work with Sony, Apple, Samsung, a whole bunch of large consumer electronics companies. We identify uh, really big stuff that matters to them. We then go to universities. We have about 600 of them that we scout at. Uh, we have relationships with those universities where they send us inventions. We find solutions that are really interesting. We then find really smart people at those or other universities, staff them around those projects, spin those things out once mature into uh, startup companies. We then act as a venture capital fund, so we sort of a mix between accelerator, incubator, and a VC fund. We finance those companies, our companies raise usually by the seed fund, uh, quite large rounds between three and four million dollars, uh, so, so fairly large round that we put together. Um, because we do deeper technology companies, so they have a bit of heft to them. Um, and then ultimately, obviously, we hope that while we nurture these companies, turn to large growth businesses, either become companies on their own or get acquired by the same big boys that we started with. Uh, that's what we do for a living. Um, just to give you one example, we, um, uh, this is a company called Algo Access. Our recent graduates are randomly chosen. They just happened to have gone out last uh, few months ago. Uh, we found a problem with a well-known mobile phone maker. Their problem is that they want to make the phone slimmer, and it turns out that the, the lens in the smartphone is actually the thickest part, the lens of the camera. Uh, so we found between the UBC, uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Columbia University in New York, we found three te te technical solutions to this problem. We brought those technical solutions together, including this professor. Uh, we brought in a whole bunch of smart people that have domain knowledge. Uh, we brought a guy from MIT, a PhD there, who did the technical stuff. We brought another PhD from um, Stanford. We brought uh, an engineering guy who's been building camera modules for the last 20 years. We brought a CEO who's just finished selling a $100 million company in mobile, in mobile devices space. Uh, brought all those guys together, uh, graduated them, as I mentioned a few months ago, uh, and they, um, they're now off. They've just uh, engaged with uh, four out of the top five uh, mobile phone uh, equipment, uh, organic uh, equipment makers, or OEMs, I can't give you the names, but four of the top five. So, in a nutshell, the how is not just about saying, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to do this. It's about being really smart. Think like an engineer, think like a system level engineer when you're planning your entrepreneurial career. Think about how do I get the most out of it? How do I gain experience as fast as possible? How do I surround myself with people that actually maximize the probability that it will be part of a successful startup as opposed to necessarily owning the startup? I mean, obviously, you want to own a piece of it, but um, optimize for success. Don't optimize for ego. Ego can come much later. You have lots of time. You're 20 something years old. You know, at 50, you can be Elon Musk. At 40, you can be Elon Musk. Right now, figure out how to get going. 
if you graduate and you have not had the opportunity to bring innovation to market, you've missed a huge part of your university career. I can speak from experience. I've built, as I said, a whole bunch of companies doing both undergrads, graduate, MBA, the whole, the whole rack. Uh, yeah, I was an MBA school, believe you me. Um, that's why I can talk so disparagingly over one of my fellows. Um, the key is in whatever you do, don't come out of your undergrad without having moved innovation forward into the world. You're wasting your own time and you're wasting society's time. So do that one favor to me and if you do, this might be the only talk I will ever get invited back to. Thanks. <laughs>